You're listening to AVA One-on-One Podcast. Come explore the no-strings-attached e-news online magazine. Our global array of authors inspire, delight, and educate with practical and entertaining articles. And with Focus On, we help producers of film, web series, and other video content attract a wider audience. Plus, your project can stream on Roku, Apple TV, Fire TV, and more with our media partners, E360 TV and NETV. No Strings Attached E-News, focusing on human interest. Advertising available, nsaen.com. The best way to keep up with everything happening around here at ABA 101 is to join our monthly newsletter. Just for joining, we give you $230 worth of free gifts from our sponsors once you confirm your email address. You can unsubscribe at any time, but why would you? Just go to our website, www.aba101.club, scroll to the bottom of the page, and subscribe. Hey guys, it's time for a new episode of ABA One on One. Open up, uh, yeah. Open up now. Open up. Open up, yeah. Open up. Open up. Open up now. Hey guys, uh, welcome to another episode of ABA 101. We're back again doing it. Um, we got a special guest, John, in the house tonight. We also have Brian and Rick. Uh, man, here we go. Um, Brian, I mean, uh, Rick, do you want to kick this one off, man? Oh, yeah. I'm, first of all, I would like to uh, say thanks to you, CJ, and Brian, and all the ABA family for allowing this thing to happen and uh, having these awesome guests that we've got. And we got probably the number one here tonight so i mm. feel very fortunate to have john gabriel on tonight yeah. welcome john welcome thanks for having me it's a, a pleasure to be with such a distinguished group <laughs> rick you sure are you sure he's one of your friends <laughs> he, he, he is my guy first, first of all i, I want to say something real quick before i want john to start telling a few stories here all right. When I first, uh, John, I, I think he'll remember that. The first time I met John was in uh, Daytona Beach uh, back in like 1996 or 97. North Carolina was coming down to play perennial national power Bethune-Cookman University. <laughs> and uh, at this place called the Ocean Center. And John was there. I don't think he was there scouting any of our players there at Bethune Cookman, but I think he was there to look at one Vince Carter and uh, maybe an Antoine Jamison. But uh, that was my first. I had to go over and meet him because, you know, here he is, the general manager of the Orlando Magic in the house. I got to go over and meet him because I'm, I'm starstruck. So that's the first time I met him. And he's been my awesome. friend ever since. Awesome. Awesome. Well, John, wow. let, let us hear it, man. Um you know, um, this blazing career, you know, how it, you know, how it came to be and, you know, uh, where are you up to now? Well, right now, oh. right now I'm uh, executive advisor to the president of basketball, Jeff Weltman, and general manager, John Hammond. I'm heading into my fourth season, be it a crazy se- season with them. It will be my 35th year in the league. Ooh. And, uh, oh. You know, I tell you who I owe it all to. I owe it to the, the people that, that either supported me or I was, or the people I was around that had the, uh, the generosity in their heart to give me a chance. Uh, you know, every morning I wake up, I'm not Jerry West. I'm not an ex-player. I'm a guy from Kutztown University in central Pennsylvania. So we gotta, I got to work a little harder than everybody else to keep up. Yeah, we know that feeling. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, we know that feeling. So, what was it? What was it like working um, with the Orlando Magic? It was great. I left the Seventy Sixers my first year in the league. I put That's a championship right. ring ring on in eighty two, eighty three, with the team of Moses, Julius, Andrew, Tony, Maurice Cheeks, 
Uh, I'm Clement Johnson. Clement, Clement, John yeah, Clement was there. Yeah. Uh, Bobby Jones and Mark Ivoroni. And so I said, this is easy. You just go get the big guy and you win a championship. <laughs> so I got, I got spoiled early on. But I left in 87 when Pat Williams wanted to have somebody that did, that that did a little bit of everything in the NBA because I was video coordinator at one point. I was the director of scouting for the Sixers. I wrote and, I wrote and produced the TV commercials. Uh, okay. I, wore, I wore a lot of hats for the Sixers. Our whole office was nine people total. And so when Pat came to, to uh, Orlando in 87, I was his first hire. And it was an honor to work with Pat. He's still one of my best friends. And during that time, I did a stint with Portland Trailblazers in the uh, – in 2004 for three years, and then I did eight years with the New York Knicks. I had worked for four different general managers, but probably my favorite was Phil Jackson. He was the last GM that I had before coming back home to, to Florida and working for the Magic. Wow. Well, uh, John, tell us about – I was just reading that today, and, and, and it just kind of brought back memories with this summer – I forget what summer it was. You was after Tim Duncan, Grant Hill, and Tracy McGrady, and you got two of the three. That's you executive of the year in '99, I think, and that 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 was that was so awesome. Well, the best acquisition we made. Uh, probably didn't know it at the time, but I recruited Doc, a guy by the name of Doc Rivers out of the broadcast booth in San Antonio. Yeah, that's made, right. Made him a head coach. Coach uh, of the year. It was coach of the year, and I was gonna. Or was it Jacksonville, Rick? I got to come back to that. But uh, uh, that was a good year for us, and uh, that was the heart and hustle team. But we we had embraced salary cap room as a as an asset, as an organization, and we looked at things arithmetically, geometrically, and uh, we were capologists, specializing in capology, and uh, we, uh, we 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 opened up enough cap room to get all three, but it, it just didn't happen. Uh, Tim changed his mind when uh, uh, he went back home and met David Robinson and David talked him out of leaving. Wow. Oh, wow, that could have been the NBA's first uh, official big three. He <laughs> hit, hit it on the head. Wow. That's it. Wow. Fantastic. You, you, you know, you know what's really sad, though. I guess for the Orlando Magic, anyway. You know, uh, Grant Hill and um, and and Dave, well, not David Robinson. Grant Hill and uh, Tracy McGrady both just had injuries. One injury, especially Grant Hill. I don't know how many games Grant Hill actually paid played for the for the Magic, but I would be willing to guess probably not one full season. In Tara's 82 games, he was always hurt. Wow, and that was very unfortunate. You yeah. know, you you think you have the mindset that a player can come back from anything, right, guys? I mean, nowadays with medicine the way it is, they find a way to to get you patched up and back in the game. And he had a fracture of his ankle, but you're right, Rick. He didn't play for two plus years, and I, I traded away. I traded away to get bird rights to, to Grant. I traded away a guy by the name of Chucky Atkins. And yeah. uh, South ben Florida. From, from, from Florida. And Ben Wallace, who wasn't Ben Wallace yet. He, he played 19 minutes a game for Doc and then went to Detroit and exploded into an all-star. But, uh, you know, those are the, the chances you take. And nobody really cares whether or not uh, – you know, the player is injured. They, they, you know, they want to see the, the product on the floor. So uh, it hurt the franchise quite a bit. And then some, and then somebody's got to take the fall. <laughs> and, and that, that's, that's the unfortunate part, but I think that happens in a, more than more than one situation that people take the fall for making mistakes. You know, that's that story about Jordan and, and, uh, well, him when he got drafted back in the eighties. I mean, it's just it's all it, the league's full of stories like that. But yeah. uh, but you know um, that's that's great. But you're talking about Daryl Armstrong talking about somebody that came came from nothing and made himself a really really good player. You know, he played at a Division two school, played football, 
at Fayetteville State University in Fayetteville, North Carolina. He was and a field then, goal kicker. He was a field goal kicker, Rick. Yep. And then about ten, what was it? Five years later, ten years later, he's starting in the NBA. I mean, played in every league in in the, in the world. Played overseas. He played in the CBA, the ABA, and that, I don't know whether he played in the ABA or not. But, I know he uh, played in the USBL as well. Uh, yeah. And yep. the CBA. I, I remember Daryl playing there. Um, I think, uh, I, as a matter of fact, like even when I played, um, when I was over in Europe uh, in the 90s, like I think I think he was over, because I was in Greece, and I think he was actually playing in um, Cyprus. He might have been playing in Cyprus at that time. Um, cause I remember we had a tournament in Cyprus and I mean, we didn't play against each other in that, in that tournament, but I did see him on the court. God, this would have been, woof, 93, maybe 92, 93 around that time. Yeah. But a, a great player, man. A great player. Well, but you know what though, Brian, I think him, like, like we talking about Chucky Atkins, that's another one. Uh, I think John will attest to this. Those are the guys that not a great deal of talent. They just made up for their lack of talent with their desire and their their never give up attitude and their ability. They wanted to make it, and I you know, you got to admire people like that. Well, that team missed the playoffs by one game, and the uh, little trivia question is: Where were the three point guards that played for the Magic that missed the playoffs by one game? Where were the three those three point guards? Drafted, and the answer is none of them were drafted. <laughs> wow. wow! 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 Well, yeah. I do remember uh, a good friend of mine playing for the Orlando Magic. Um, Brian Shaw uh, had played with the with the Magic uh, during those years with Shaq. Um, Did you bring him, John? Absolutely. He was probably one of the best kept. Secrets to our success. Come, he came off the bench for us. Uh, he, he subs in for for Penny Hardaway. Yeah, and uh, he did a tremendous job. I'm a big fan of Brian's. Yeah, because Santa Barbara. Yeah, because both both me and Brian we played at UC Santa Barbara. Uh, yeah, so like uh, he, he. This is a, a little known story, but um, Shaq and Brian used to do this play where Shaq would take one step towards Brian and then turn and he'd just throw it up to the rim. That play there, I introduced that to Brian Shaw when we were at uh, Santa Barbara. And we called it step one is what we called it. And uh, we used to just catch teams and players off guard by just taking a step towards him and then I'll just spin and he'll throw it up to the rim. And uh, I saw... You know, we stay in touch even today. And, like, I was in Los Angeles uh, last year around September time, and uh, we were on the phone talking. And he had to tell me, he said, you know that play we used to do in college? That's what I showed to Shaq. And that's why we connected on so many uh, alley-oops, which is a little-known fact. For people you can do there. a lot of stuff with Shaq. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, you can do a whole lot with Shaq. <laughs> tell there us you about go. your relationship with Shaq, John. It's still, it's still good. He, uh, uh, when he had left the team and I would scout a game and he would be at it, he, he called me over off the floor to come over and say hi and give him a hug. And uh, I'm a little nervous about tampering or, or re-tampering. And uh, <laughs> I would postpone that hug. But I, I'm, I'm so proud of him him as, and so many guys that have done a, a good job. And that's one of the things I'm working with the magic on now is developing and, and enriching a, an alumni program because we've had so many, over 330 players that wore the magic pinstripe now. Guys like Greg Kite, are, who, uh, who was an ex-Boston Celtic, played for the magic, and they're, they're grandfathers now. So, oh, yeah. so it's time to bring them back together and, and – show some support and love for them beyond the dollars we paid. Yeah, we had, uh, we had Greg Kite and Paul McKeskey on a show earlier in the year, and they, they were just awesome. I mean, just 
beyond yeah. awesome. And like, so I think I said, I see Greg Kite uh, every so often. He lives there in Orlando, but he's uh-huh. he, he's just one of those another one of those guys that got the most out of his ability, whatever he had. You know, I I think that's that's very admirable. Hey, John, I I got a quick question, CJ here. Um, uh, being a being a a guy that's gone out and got players that were people everyone didn't know about and everyone wasn't chasing at the time. Um, you know, a lot of uh, young uh, ABA players today, uh, the league is not the same as it was back then, but a lot of uh, um, good talent is coming out of the ABA uh, that, you know, uh, just doesn't get that opportunity to kind of cross over. Uh, what would you kind of suggest for some of those guys that, you know, may really be skilled, not, you know, not just thinking they're good and, you know, not be good, but those guys that are skilled, what would you kind of tell them that's coming from a league like that where maybe they could get seen by the right kind of person that might help their career? Well, you know, it's a cliche, but things don't really change from when you're playing in high school or middle school on into college, into the pros. The guys that do the little things are the guys that get recognized I uh, signed a, a player by the name of Pablo Porgiani when I was in New York with the Knicks. And he was 36 years old at the time, but I, I went over to see him play. And I said, this is a guy that, that's willing to do everything and anything he can. He guarded, like Darryl, he guarded 90 feet on the floor. Uh, uh, so, you know, make yourself indispensable as a player is probably the thing that I'd say. And here's the thing, on, you brought up a good point on scouting. Uh, the, the guys that uh, aren't on the radar for everyone else. Uh, you know, teams, NBA teams should spend as much money as they can because you only have to find one guy like once every 10 years to make it worth uh, worth its while in, in salaries to find a, a good player that can, can help a team. So I'm, I'm a big fan of scouting. And, and getting out and having a strong scouting group. And, uh, and I just, I would just say, show every time that you're out there that you're willing to give it all and you'll do the little things and you'll get recognized. Awesome. That's, yeah, that's some great advice. Great advice. I mean, because I guess today's game, uh, John, you, and, and you, and you kind of mentioned it there with guys, you know, game not really changing from the um, high school level right through. And it's about that work ethic and, you know, doing the little things that matter. Mm. What's your views in terms of kind of the trend of the player? I mean, you know, years ago, we had the, the trend of the player getting that development, getting groomed, getting a little bit smarter. Uh, to the game when they spent, say, three years to four years in college, as opposed to today's athlete. And I know a lot of it has to do with just physical ability, but what do you think about the trend towards the the one and done now? It seems like if you're you're in college longer than two years, then you're you're a broken athlete, so to speak. What are your views? Yeah. That's a really, really good point. Broken athlete or, or damaged goods, it's almost like we prejudice against guys that, that either come out after their junior or senior year, and particularly we prejudice against guys that come out and decide to go back, uh, yeah. which they're allowed to do. Uh, but there have been a lot of very good success stories prior to the, the league implementing that you've got to go to one year of school because we had some of them and uh, guys that had did one year or guys that came straight out, the Kobe's of the world, uh, Jermaine O'Neal, uh, so mm-hmm. many of these guys. Kevin Garnett. Kevin Garnett. They did pretty darn good for themselves and they did a good job managing their money and funds as well. So uh, the, game, the game has changed now. In fact, I'm doing a study for John and Jeff just to show where the, the game is going in regards to being able to shoot the ball from range. I mean, now it's not only can you shoot threes, but can you shoot threes from a, a full step behind the three-point line 
as mm -hmm. you know, as the Houston Rockets, you know, shot more threes in the playoffs than uh, a, a team did in 15 years ago in the whole season. So you got to be able to shoot the ball, and the percentage has gone up as well. It used to be you were good if you were 32 to 34, but now it's 36 to 38 percent from three. And so when I go through a college evaluation, which I have the last four years for the Magic, uh, this was, I got to tell you, it's one of the first things I look, look for. Can, can you stroke it? And uh, uh, it's, the, it's the name of the game right now. We'll see if it goes back to the Twin Towers uh, at any time soon. But even that, we want the bigs to be able to be floor spreaders uh, by being able to shoot the three. But you know, also, John, the thing that I really, I really focus a lot on is the mid-range game, which is kind of a forgotten part of, of, of basketball now because you either shoot the three or you're going to take it to the hole and dunk on somebody. Those guys that can make those 15 to 19 footers consistently and are willing to take them because, you know, that old adage, you know, threes count more than twos. But not if you're shooting a low percentage, they don't, you know, because the Rockets, which is one of my favorite teams, of course, um, that in the playoffs, they've had a history of just going completely cold. And, just, yeah. you know, when that three's not falling, you know, you don't have anything much to go back to. So I think that's a, that's a point, good point. In, in 89, we, we had our uh, expansion draft as a new franchise with the Minnesota Timberwolves. We both came in together. Miami and Charlotte came in ahead of us in 88. And in 89, we had a choice between uh, a couple guards. And we took one Nick Anderson over Pooh Richardson. And Nick still holds a lot of records for us. But he could – he had the ability – he went to the University of Illinois. He had the ability to, dr to dribble right up to the to – the, almost to the rim, like – that, that tough 10, 11 footer and rise up and shoot it right over the top of the front of the rim without the board. And, and I, and I it, it just amazed me that he could do that. So now that's become a lost art. Uh, yeah. As, yeah. as maybe as mm -hmm. being able to drive the basketball to the hole. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it, there, there are things that they are done in the day that need to come back and, and will probably, you know, resurrect themselves uh, in the future of the league. And do you think? Do you think that has to do with, uh, say, the the analytics of the game? Like I, I had taken a course, a GM scouting course, um, a couple of years ago, and I found that that was one of the biggest, uh, I guess, biggest turnabouts in the game when I'm when I was studying it was about the analytics side of things. And, you know, like, because I had to put together a, uh, an MBA per program um, as a part of the course because it was being driven so hard by the analytics and synergy and things of that nature. Do you think that that has more to do with how the style of today's game is as opposed to what it used to be? Yeah, you know, the, the, the league... The league installed this camera system about, what was it? I may have it wrong. You can fact check me about two, three years ago where there's every NBA arena has 22 cameras that, that record every movement. And, you know, so things are so much more measurable. But, but as far as shooting goes, you need a decent sample size from a player to really have an accurate feel uh, for how good of a, sh a shooter he is or how he contributes or does he, does he shoot off the dribble? Uh, and uh, analytics can tell you that. Is he, is he uh, a corner threat? Uh, uh, you know, how many people touch the ball before he gets a shot? That was, that was probably one of the more important things with Phil Jackson's triangle offense is that it, I, I felt it was a, I felt it was a, uh, a teamwork placebo, if you will, mm -hmm. because he had great players. He had Shaquille, he had Kobe, uh, he had Michael, 
But in the triangle, you have to make almost at least two to three passes before it gets to the other side of the court and to the guy you really want to shoot the ball. But yeah. it, got, it got everybody involved. So uh, analytics plays its part, but it, 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 nothing takes the place of seeing somebody in person. Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. <laughs> I definitely agree with that. I, I, another thing I want to mention also, it's in terms of entertainment. Um, the There was a 30 for 30 deal, I don't know, that's been three or four or five years ago, called This Magic Moment. If anybody, yeah, has, if anybody has not seen that, and I think, uh, well, I didn't think John Gabriel played a played a pretty pivotal role in that in that documentary, and I and, and I thought it was just, I've seen it probably six or eight times, and I thought it was so so well done. Yeah, yeah. The way the way it was portrayed, and just mm. giving people the credit for what they did with that franchise, because that franchise, you know, it was nothing. And like like John said, he went out and drafted Nick Anderson. And, uh, you know, it was just, it's amazing. But, you know, a great deal of luck comes into it, too. You know, two, two first, two first picks, rounds. <laughs> no, first picks. Two yeah, first, first picks. Two picks. Exactly. In a row. <laughs> and you know what, guys? We were young enough to, to sort of kick ourselves in the, in the butt when it came to re-signing Shaquille. We, we sort of, and, and we did actually look like a, a, a young franchise in that, there was some question that people don't remember this, but there was some question that he wanted more than uh, Alonzo Mourning, who was a brutal force in the middle, and had a different had a different game than Shaquille. And but mm -hmm. Shaq will tell you today that he knew the number he wanted, and it had a one in front of it, and then a bunch of zeros. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine that. And we 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 tapped the brakes and lost to Jerry West, mm. and uh, you know, shame on us. Yeah, but I think you know, in the long run, everything works out for the best. I, that you know, it's that's you can always go back and look at that. You go, know, the people are still going back and looking. Why did why did uh, Portland take uh, take Sam was it Sam Bowie? Damn yeah, good. yeah. Yep. Yep. Instead of Michael Jordan, I mean, that, you know, it becomes a crapshoot. I mean, that's you know, you don't know. And and then uh, who was Clyde Drexler? Didn't he? Did Portland already had Clyde Drexler? Why did they need Michael Jordan? Why did they need Jordan? Yeah, yeah. that's same the same position. I mean, and so, you know, you know, you know who the, uh, the 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 team that they compared themselves to was the Houston Rockets, and the feeling was in Portland. You know, after the fact, you know, it was that they had Elijah Wan and Samson, and and you weren't going to win if you didn't have two big guys. So that's why they went that way. Is also on top of things. Okay. Ooh. Yeah, that's right. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. But well, all... I, guess that, I, guess, I guess that was just following the trend. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you, you know? had to you had to figure out who you had to beat more than you had to figure out how to be better as a team. You know, yeah. Who do we have to get by? And, uh, and then you build your team that way. And that sometimes can be a mistake. And those are the things that I, I sort of bring to the table for the Magic now and saying, why, why did we make that decision? On what premise? And if you make it mm. on the wrong premise, you can make a big mistake. Wow, wow. You know, that's an interesting point you mentioned there, John. That's a very interesting point because, like here, for instance, um, in Australia, professional basketball here with the NBL, that's kind of the trend. It's and I, and I had made mention to that years ago, the fact that, you know, one team here would have success with, uh, you know, say, two import forwards, uh, wow. you know, big guys around the basket. So then – every other team follows suit and goes and gets two big guys. Yeah, really. And then another team will show up and have a, a, a point guard that dominates the floor. And then the next thing you know, every other team goes and gets a point guard. So, it's, you know what I mean? It's like it's, it's following – it follows that trend rather than being that trendsetter. You know, yeah. you got a lot of trend followers. How about that? You know? 
It's, you know, it's, I, I think I think basketball has has always been that to a certain extent. I remember going back to college days, back at Michigan State, when Judd Heathcote had Magic Johnson and those guys, and they ran that two three matchup zone. Now that was a hot thing. The next yeah. two or four years, everybody wanted to run that two three magic a two three matchup zone, and then you Bobby Knight was running the the uh, motion offense and and yeah. whatever was hot at the time, people tried to emulate. And I always thought that was kind of common, but you know, and I'll tell this real quick. I went to a clinic one time and John Wooden was speaking and he was talking about the UCLA high post offense. And I was a high school coach. So I'm sitting there writing as hard as I can. I must've written probably eight, six or eight pages of notes. And then I started thinking now, uh, I don't think it, I have Bill Walton at the high post and Keith Wilkes on the baseline and John <laughs> Bell. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to, <laughs> but I'm just saying though, because that was hot at the time. And John Wooden's talking, so man, I'm 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 no, I'm gonna win a national championship because I don't. But you gotta have those kind of players, I guess is what I'm you saying. Do. Yeah, you, you do. can't win the Kentucky Derby with a jackass. <laughs> <laughs> so true, so true. Hey guys, Rick, Rick, Rick hey. Pitino. Oh, uh, there you go. Hey guys, we are <clears throat> we're getting close to winding up here. Got about eight minutes left, but uh, John, we always do this with every guest. We always try to ask. Do you have any, like, really memorable, cool story about your career coming up that you always tell people at the parties? <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, it's a it's sort of an embarrassing one a little bit. Uh, oh, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's audio, uh, not video. Yeah, we, yeah. We, we, we don't mind. We don't procrastinate. We don't mind. It's, it's only being broadcast to the world. We don't yeah. we remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about basketball. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier in the show, Pat Williams, he was the, the founder of the Orlando Magic here in Florida in 1987, two years before we played our first game. And I was blessed enough to, that he brought me down as his first employee. And uh, Pat really let me do a little bit of everything. He really did. He let, let me basically help run the draft and free agency and so forth. And by the time we got to the NBA Finals with Shaquille and Penny, I felt, you know, a sense of ownership of the, of the roster, but, but knew my place. I might have been assistant GM. I might have been a VP of personnel at the time. And uh, we, beat, we beat the, which was the only, was, which was the last time that happened, we beat the Chicago Bulls with Michael Jordan in the playoffs in, in 95. And mm. we go on to the NBA Finals. Eastern Conference Finals, and I remember running through the hallway in my suit to the locker room to, to greet the guys and, and congratulate them, and uh, Pat Williams walked in, and Pat sat on the bench in the back of the locker room, and I re remember composing myself. Joel Glass, the PR director, said, okay, I'm going to open the door to the media, and I'm like, how's my tie look? You know, I'm, what, what am I going to say? You know, let me get my words down. And the door flew open, the Magic came in celebrating with Horace Grant on their shoulders, and the media followed in, and they ran right by me. They went right to, <laughs> went right to Pat Williams, who explained how he put the team together. And I said, I just remember saying to myself, this isn't my time. <laughs> That's cruel. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Oh, man. The guy put in all the work, man. Oh, it's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> oh, oh, God. Well, look, man. I, go ahead, Rick. Uh, CJ, I got I to gotta mention this. Like I said, I wasn't going to mention it because I, John Gabriel is one of the – I don't know how many people are still left that was in, in the presence of Wilt Chamberlain when he scored 100 points. Oh. That's a little known fact that I, I dropped all the that. time. Wow. Wow. Wow, that is awesome, man. A hundred yeah. points. Wow, so you were there for that. That's awesome. <laughs> I lived about 20 minutes from Hershey, Pennsylvania, where the game was played, and my dad played first base for the Dodgers. He had a cup of coffee for a year and then went to the minors, so he was a sports guy. And my dad took myself at six years old wow. uh, and my two brothers to the game. And wow. I told this story in, in Italy when I went to my hometown, Kiete, where the team's named the Kiete Magic. And uh, wow, 
I told the story about how my dad took me to the game. And I said, I tugged on his, on his, uh, at that time, men wore suits to games. And I tugged on his sleeve and I said, I said, Papa, I said, I've got to go pee. And uh, he said, John, something great's going to happen here. You have to wait before you go to the bathroom to see, <laughs> to see what happens. And the, the, the one of the trivia is there's been 30,000 people said they were at that game. But the In Philadelphia, won, right, John? It was, it was the Philadelphia Warriors against the Knicks. Yeah, was, but everybody said they were in Philadelphia. <laughs> and the game wasn't even in Philadelphia. <laughs> no, it wasn't. And, yeah, that's uh, right. It was. There was only 8,000 There's only eight thousand seats in the Hershey Arena, so that's how you can talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> uh, oh, man. So I guess that's my dad story. wasn't really there, huh? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, <laughs> hey, hey, John, definitely, definitely <clears throat> awesome having you on here. Um you know, we, we, we enjoy um, uh, reaching back and, and talking to people that uh, help uh, make the game what it is. You know, we, we, love, the, we love the game here. Every, every one of us are involved in basketball one way or another, which is really cool. So I um, want to say thanks for being on our show. And, you know, if you ever want to come back, you're more than welcome. Thanks so much for having me. It's a, a pleasure to speak to, to you all. And, and you've got the – the uh, NBA media guide in, in one Rick Waldron. I tell you that. He knows it all. <laughs> oh, yeah. The global encyclopedia, baby. <laughs> Thank you so much for saying that, John. That means a lot coming from you. That means a lot coming from you. <laughs> Never let the truth stop. There you go, Rick. <laughs> That's it. Uh, that Rick's it. mic just cut out, man. Oh, Hey, Rick, you back? Oh. Your mic just cut out. Y'all be safe. Yeah, you said never let, and then cut out. Oh, never let the truth stand in the way of a good story. There you go, there my brother. Go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on that, we're going to get out of here, gentlemen. Thank you for being on ABA 101. And, hey, I don't know who we're having on next week, but, man, uh, so far it's been so it's been really good. And uh, Jim hope, Clement. Yeah, I hope really informative. Yeah, that's right, talking to Jim. Yeah, so it should be really good. Gentlemen, said, thank you. He said to you, hello, John. All right, sounds good. Good, All right, good, guys. Good, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Yeah, and right. everyone, take care. We'll talk soon. All right, B. All right, CJ. See you, John. See you guys. All right, guys. Take care. Peace. Good night. Peace. The American Basketball Association is the largest pro league in the world. Some great opportunities for team ownership are available, and the cost may surprise you. If you've ever thought about team ownership in a pro league, give us the opportunity to help make it a reality. Reach out to us for more info. For USA teams at www.abaliveaction.com. In Australia, go to www.abaleagueaustralia.com. Have you heard of Modair? They have some of the safest products on the planet, free from over 3,000 harmful ingredients. They send me product specials and birthday surprises, and every time I order, I could win a Modair Escape from the rewards program. The easy-to-use app means I can order anywhere, anytime. Give it a try. Download the app. Use my promo code, 3i6w8k, and get $10 shopping credit on your first order. Share with friends, and they get $10 as well. Modair. Stylish. Safer. Smarter. Modair is a proud sponsor of ABA 101. We have lots of athletes using their liquid bio cells like former NFL player Willie Harper. Have a look for yourself. You can either go to www.modair.com or www.modair.com.au. Use our show promo code 3i6w8k. Get $10 off on your first order. It costs you nothing to look. Sassy B Worldwide Productions. With over 25 years of entertainment experience, we have done it all. Celebrity appearances, red carpet events, image consultation, and branding design. Our clients range from American football stars to Hollywood celebrities and everyone in between. Want to make a splash in the entertainment industry? Then it's time to get sassy. Sassy B Worldwide 
www.thepeopleshow.com. Well, that's going to do it for this week. Remember, you can keep up with every episode by subscribing via our website. Follow us on social media and tell your friends about us. Next week, new guests, more basketball tips, more basketball stories about the game we all love. Till then, be safe and keep your eyes on the ball. Give him a bone.